Hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your co-host and with us today, once again, our good friend Edward, and he is going to walk us through his latest program. We're going to give some information at the end of the program um, about different recordings that Edward's done in the past. You can find on our Washington, D.C. History and Culture YouTube channel. And also later on this month, we'll save time to talk about the two in-person tours, um, guided historical walking tours that Edward's going to be doing in Washington, D.C. for our friends that are either living in Washington, D.C. or going to be visiting in the next few weeks. So with that, Edward, I will turn things over to your, you. It's all yours. Take it away. Um, hi, everybody. Hello, Robert. Hello, Patricia. Thank you very much for uh, joining uh, us this afternoon. And many of you are probably pink people out in the sun. I'm a, I will say it, a European American and by definition, one of the pink people. So. The question then, how did pink people become whites? An archaeology of a color and a theory of history. And at my feet, I have Rabbit, uh, my little dependent here who may want to go out, but that's OK. Um, so we start off. Before the mid-1600s, there's no evidence that English refer to themselves as white people. The concept did not occur until the early 1600s, when the English society first encountered contrasted themselves against East Indians. There was not a large body of people who considered themselves white as we know the term. From the 1550s to 1600, white was exclusively describing elite English women because the whiteness of skin signaled they were not, they were persons of high color. So, and today's debates on abortion and reproduction is part of this conversation as we'll try to make it clear later. Whiteness is a constantly shifting boundary separating those who are entitled to have certain privileges from those whose exploitation and vulnerability to violence is justified by their not being white. Uh, and really to cut to the chase, this goes back to 1096, Pope Urban I in his call for the first uh, crusade. So uh, we have some ancient history to walk through. The larger project that this is part of, very quickly, is um, and some of you may have seen parts of these presentations already. White supremacy and colonialism, how a Christianized race dominance explains the capital coup, evidences of which we see often, and we've seen it if you've been watching the, the select committee on TV and the various evidences that are presenting, or at least the potential evidences. And my wider experience here explores the hardening of enlightenment practices of race. and. We um, probably most of us with an undergraduate education in philosophy associate enlightenment with uh, uh, ethics 101 and we say, what has that to do with enslavement? Well, we'll see. Uh, in particular, the development of chattel slavery prepared for and confirmed the models of 20th century US white empire. And we go, US white empire? What is all of this? So the series includes where we are today, how pink people became white, and archaeology. And an archaeology is a historical dig. So we're going to be doing some historical digging just as this next weekend in DC, I'll be doing a, a historical dig around the town and to which people are personally welcome. And the second one of these, which will be forthcoming oh, after Robert graciously gives us the space, how Jesus became a European and learned to love the Confederacy. Two others not necessarily related to where we're going here, but I've done these with Robert already and DC Culture and History. White Separatism, the 51st day of Jefferson, white supremacy, January 6th, and law enforcement. So with that as a background, here's first four observations about race, the word and its developing use. And I take these from texts over a period of 175 years, most of them Anglo-American texts. Justice Roger Tawney, writing for the majority of the Dred Scott decision in 1857. It's a crucial decision, and if you have not read it, I would say drop what you're doing, even this, um, go to Wikipedia and read it, or someplace. It is difficult at this day to realize the state of public opinion in relation to that unfortunate race which prevailed in the civilized and enlightened portions of the world at the time of the Declaration of Independence when the Constitution of the United States was framed and adopted. But the public history of every European nation displays in it a manner too plain to be mistaken. 
they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race either in social or political relations and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Okay, this is the Supreme Court. We have been paying some attention to them recently. The California Supreme Court three years earlier. The California Supreme Court ruled that the testimony of a Chinese man who witnessed a murder by a white man was inadmissible based upon the opinion that the Chinese were, quote, a race of people whom nature has marked as inferior and who are incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point. And as such, had no right, quote, to swear away the life of a citizen, close quote, or participate, quote, with us in administering the affairs of our government. California, by the way, came within a vote of having uh, enslavement and segregation built into its constitution. UNESCO, 1950, the race question. Thus, many national, religious, geographic, linguistic, or cultural groups have, in such loose usage, been called race, when obviously Americans are not a race, nor Englishmen, nor Frenchmen, nor English women, nor French women, or any other national group. Catholics, Protestants, Muslim, Jews are not races, nor are groups who speak English or any other language thereby definable as a race. People who live in Iceland or England or India are not races, nor are people who are culturally Turkish or Chinese or the like, thereby describable as races. UNESCO, by the way, is the United Nations. National, religious, geographic, linguistic, and cultural groups do not necessarily coincide with racial groups, and the cultural traits of such groups have no demonstrated genetic connection with racial traits. And one more. The 2000 and 2010 U.S. Census form says this. Racial categories, quote, generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country. They do not conform to any biological, anthropological, or genetic criteria, close quote. As we will see a little bit later, uh, many of the Supreme Court cases during the early 20s uh, define race in exactly this way. So where are we here on all this? Race is, as uh, Geraldine, Professor Geraldine Hing, in the invention of race in the European Middle Ages, and it's European Middle Ages here that's important to understand. She says, race is one of the primary names we have for a repeating tendency to demarcate human beings through selected differences that are identified as absolute and fundamental, so as to distribute power differentially to human groups. In race making, strategic essentialisms are posited and assigned through a variety of practices. To pause here just for a moment, uh, th those of us who are women, for example, understand this from a very particular kind of way. When one's parent says to one, why don't, why don't you act like a guy and dress like a woman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, gender uh, operates in the same sort of fashion. Power is differentially distributed through strategic essentialisms that are always constantly being broken. So she writes, race is a structural relationship for the management of human differences. It should not surprise us that race and gender both come to quote the new world where I started our music this afternoon uh, from enlightenment thought. In 1275 in England, the statute of Jewry, as far back as then, mandated residential segregation for Jews and Christians, inaugurating what would become the beginning of the ghetto practice in Europe. England's expulsion of its Jews in 1290 marked the first permanent expulsion of Jewish persons in Europe. And in every country of Europe, in different eras, England's example would be followed. So race as we understand it has a lengthy prehistory, including culture, 
the emergence of biological impulse, the simple need to categorize. The sociologist Mary Douglas says, uh, uh, dirt is simply matter in the wrong place. And that's something of the same sort. And to understand this need to categorizing, you go back to, for example, R.I. Moore's The Formation of a Persecuting Society. And, and he argues that from the 10th to the 13th centuries, the time when uh, the First Crusade was called by uh, Pope Urban I, the, in Europe, appearance of popular heresy and the establishment of the Inquisition, expropriation and mass murder of Jewish persons, propagation of elaborate measures to segregate lepers from the healthy and curtail their presence. These were seen traditionally as separate developments and explained in terms of the problems of which the victims presented, but as a matter of fact, these are conjoined strategies of dominance, gradually covered by the development of race, which then becomes a notion out of a categorical way of thinking social. Geraldine, hang again. Race is a structural relationship for the articulation and management of human difference. Religion, the paramount source of authority in the Middle Ages, and I, I, I would say until, through January 6th, function social culturally as well as biopolitically. That religion is not simply about some other world, it's about how this world functions. We're gonna be talking later in, in Genesis, and I use the expression, the, 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 the theopolitics, the geopolitics, the theological geopolitics of Genesis, and that's kind of what I mean. The subjecting people of a society of a socially degraded faith to a political structure or theology can biologize, define, and essentialize an entire community as fundamentally and absolutely different in an interwoven cluster of ways, socially, economically, politically, morally. Pope Urban's God Wills It, The Just War, 1096, uh, he calls for to retake the, 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 quote, the Holy Land Jerusalem and, 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 and in the, the various consolidations of this over there, and the reason he's doing that, of course, was that the Vatican at that particular point or the, the church at that particular point was losing, losing any sort of power that it, that it had at that area. Uh, and the emergence of a pan-European identity begins to consolidate questions of dominance. So going back to Tawny, going back to the UNESCO, going back to the California Supreme Court, the constant referencing to European, 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 European. We need to remember that this is a, a European quest for dominance. Race making in the interests of empire and later nationalism. And Heng would say that race making is the process by which strategic essentialisms are posited and assigned through a variety of practice and prejudice. Women persons wear dresses, men, person, men persons do this, at least in this particular country. So the various kinds of practices that we are enforced into act like a man, dress like a lady. I think that's the way it is, so the other way around, I never remember um, being queer. I'm a kind of a, a, a failed gender project just to begin with. So this is how we construct a hierarchy of people for different treatments. So to conclude a very wordy introductory session, Race isn't, well, it's not a coherent biological concept over the last four or 500 years. Uh, it's, it's timely and it's certainly a potent and all-purpose cultural tool, procedure or category. It's like, well, uh, you know, if, if one wants to end a conversation, one says, well, God told me to do it and that ends the conversation. Uh, race is that kind of thing, well, it's all racial and that ends any kind of discussion because it, it's a, it, it pulls a card. Over the time, accorded or denied benefits of privileges, which is what it does, an American system and society developed the notion of race early in its formation, sorry to put it quite this way, to justify its emerging econ economic system of chattel capitalism. Did it understand that it was doing this? No, but as we will see, the laws beginning really rather late before they start parsing this out, begin to differentiate a certain kind of person by, from other kinds of people based on skin color, the white. Which, and this depends on the institutions of forced labor, enslavement of indigenous peoples, native to the Americas, as well as African. 
And by the way, I will say this, I've said it in other places, my practice is not to use the expression African-American unless I'm also using the expression European-American. Uh, linguistically, if one is focusing constantly at uh, X, a, a certain kind of person hyphenated from an unhyphenated position, uh, it seems ingenuous, but as a matter of fact, it's, con it's constantly references that other person or group as a different place and in a lower linguistic position. But so the concept of race as we understand it evolves alongside formation of the United States and deeply connected with the evolution of two other terms, white and slave. You wanna go back to 1790, the Naturalization Act, the first act of the first Congress, free white person. And we're saying, um, what, how can they get all those words into the same phrase? What does free white person mean? Aren't all white people free? No, they weren't, as a matter of fact. Uh, and the fact that the, the first law in 1790 in the naturalization, they were aware then of the kinds of persons and the different hierarchies of power that they were calling them. Race and slave, quote, were all used by Europeans in the 1500s. And they brought these words with them to North America, and, and we'll see a little bit of that. However, the words did not have the meaning that they have today. White probably first occurs in Prince 1613 in a play by Mallory, as, const as constructed to persons, quote, discovered in the so-called new world. And there's lots of scare quotes because it's like, we're discovering new people and it's, quote, it's a new world. Well, it actually predates the old world by a, a good sense of millennia. Uh, at, at the time that London was struggling along uh, places, places in Mexico uh, and Tehachapan were five times as large in the Aztec Empire. So persons, be, that is, will be used as products employed in the making of capital, and Karl Marx always trenchant observes. The turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins signaled the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production in Das Kapital, 1867. Um, Greg Vanden book, The Empire of Necessity, Slavery, Freedom and Deception, is an astonishing good book. Uh, it goes all the way to the borders in Texaco, to, to Texas, to the early borders in New England. Okay, so um, a lot of theory here, and I know it's a hot day, and um, if you need to stand and do push-ups and get a drink, go ahead. Uh, three sections. First, white, a theory of history. The world got along without race for the overwhelming majority of its history. The U.S. has never been without it. And we see that, as I said, in 1790, the first Naturalization Act. The first words out of its Congress's lips were to say, were, were to differentiate different kinds of people, not only in terms of color, but in terms of civilian uh, status, free or not free. Uh, we have been living with that since. In 1920, uh, Du Bois uh, characterizes what he calls then the new religion of whiteness, a religion founded on the dogma that, quote, of all of the shoes of God, whiteness alone is inherently and obviously better than brownness and tan. Uh, du Bois gives us the expression that I'm sure you have heard of, the color line. He, he rejects the idea, he's actually a graduate of Harvard himself, he, re he rejects the idea, it's still common in his day, that races reflected natural divisions within the human species. And, and this is where he gets that, is that one removed from Jefferson, and we'll see that. Uh, the, the inevitable corollary that the physical, mental, and behavioral traits associated with the white race just happen to be the ones most prized by modern societies. Just to say a moment ago, the way I talked about, the way we talk about hyphenated people, and, and actually Toni Morrison, just I recently saw a quote from her, she says, well, uh, white is for America. I mean, us hyphenated people are, are the rest. So just this notion that uh, the white race happens to have certain kinds of unmarked necessary privileges um, in, in a certain kind of society. So what we're trying to do here is look at, so where, how did all this arrive to this point? But this, I'm gonna go back again to Thomas Jefferson, and, and there's not a lot of love lost between me and Mr. Jefferson and his, uh, his uh, how do we say, complicated family life. He had attempted to delineate, quote, the real distinctions which nature has made between the races in notes of the state of Virginia. And it's a short text. 
If you have not read Virginia and if you want to rethink Mr. Jefferson, go find that one. It's also the view that would appear two centuries later in Charles Murray and Hernstein's bell curve. Jefferson suggested, it was with Jefferson's permission that much of the thinking of the Confederacy, much of the 19th century and later 20th century, uh, theoreticians around race, would essentially begin with the assumption about the real distinctions which nature has made between the races. At the same time, without understanding that the word that they're using for, for the races uh, is conceptually incoherent in that sense. So, race is not a thing, nor is it the issue. Slavery does not derive from racism, and this, I'm borrowing a bit of this from Du Bois as well as uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, racism derives from slavery and the economics and apologetics of empire, and apologetics of empire is largely what you see happening still, and we see it, and I'll say it right now, in, in the same voice that we're talking about, we talk about white supremacy, uh, the other links in there that need to be addressed is the gendered link and the the reproductive uh, policing link because the, the point of white supremacy and births and deaths and who was there and who, who had the power, all of these are connected however much they are kept separated in your basically your daily commons. But the term race is used taxonomically as a biological descriptor and as a social predicator, we saw that. Uh, but the bell jars suggested that certain kinds of people uh, and, you know, as a gay man, when someone comes at me with g g genetics, so DNA proves that you want to go, you want to run the other way because as soon as they start putting science on you, be careful. In both of these ways, the concept is conceptually incoherent. Biology, race does not describe biology, nor does it apportion social skills. Another good text, Winthrop D. Jordan, anything that he writes on this, the white man's burden, historical origins, 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 sorry, of racism in the United States. So colorism, as we are now are thinking about the word that we probably use, and Jefferson probably wouldn't use it, he would understand it. Um, the, the planters in Virginia certainly understood colorism, and they understood that certain kinds of persons would do better in the house, and certain kinds of persons would do better on the farm. They didn't call it colorism, but they would they, they would use the word in their ads as a lively type, but it, but this colorism is not. It's a practice. It's how we adjudicate and separate, and how Mr. Jefferson could have uh, at least six enslaved children by a fourteen-year-old enslaved woman that, that came to his household as part of the dowry for his sister, and it was the practice of that engagement and the separating of those particular children that gives you what we're talking about here, colorism. And so white, in italics as I'm using it, is an intersection of practices, everything from walking down the street and being told to get off the sidewalk, to if you're in Virginia and you're registering your birth, and this is still the case in the 20th century, if you were registering a birth, it was black or white, period. Uh, that is to say, if you were any other combination of any other kind of person, including a Native Indigenous American, Hispanic, uh, Latin, X, or any other kind of uh, person, you are bureaucratically erased in Virginia. As a Virginia clergy person, when I go to do a Virginia wedding, the, the court has me uh, indicate that, quote, I have seen both of the bride and the groom. While they can't, while they couldn't when that form was originated, um, actually admit that they were segregating and, and miscegenation, they could at least rely upon um, practical clergy to, to practice the fact for them. Race making then, uh, to quote again, the process by which strategic essentialism are posited and assigned. So in colonial practice, in the first time used in 1613, the 16th century age exploration, and remember, 1603, you're talking about King James, you're talking about the King James Bible, and you're, you're, if those of you who are familiar with the James Bible, we'll pick up the text and you'll see where Jesus says, for I no longer call you uh, servants. And you know, we think about this all the time, and, but then we look at the Greek, and the Greek word is doule, which is slave. That the King James Version in 1603 simply erases the language of enslavement from the Bible, period. What wonders? 
already they knew something that they're not telling us. So the word enslavement, and when we hear, you know, you hear kind of the, the fundamentals on the left and the right, it's for, uh, no longer do I call you master, we hear it in Lord Jesus. Where are we getting this language? If you heard that in some other place, you'd understand where master and Lord come from. So, and you go back to Elizabethan trading, colonial training, in the beginnings in Shakespeare, you go back to, to the Tempest, and you go back to Othello, uh, you go back to the unknown and unknown black and white pulled in from other discourses. I don't have time to, to go through a lot of this here, but in terms of ascetics and social and political history, we talked a bit about uh, white skin and uh, we use the expression redneck. So there's the ascetics and social practice and politics um, if you are familiar with your, your Puritan text, you know, Cotton Mather, and they talk about the devil and the black man and the red man, and the notion of the, of the red man, and the reason that one of the, the DC got rid of the name of its, uh, of its uh, t uh, t baseball team the name, or the football team name. Um, the kind of coloring of the skin has a history uh, that w wasn't pleasant, and the, 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 the red skin is a flayed body. Time to get rid of that. So Elizabeth niche notions of blackness, association with the devil, basis and bestiality, a long history on the meaning of color, and that's partly that's from Tony Morrison. So if you were in Professor Ed's Enlightenment 101 ethics course, you would be taking some passing note about this, and the development of race as a biological category in 1457 it seemed unexceptional, at least seems to us common sense. Oh, well, yes, there are races there, this race, now, that race, other thing. But to the contrary, it's social profiling. I use the word profiling here with uh, full intent. It's a protocol rather than biology. You see the work, it calls it sistema nature. Linnaeus calls the system natural, but the description itself. Okay, the variations of the homo, European, American, Asian, African. Description is always evaluation. European, Asian, African. You go through it and you see that already he has put in terms in 18, 1757, he has already delineated the order of importance of the four races. So there's the kind of a, this faux biology in the formation of race. The, the beginnings of biological categorizing and the need to explain and to justify emerged late and you're going, well, why, is, why is Linnaeus having to kind of justify this and arrange this, these kinds of ways? Nowhere in this Sistema Natura does it talk about the uh, African enslaved persons, but as a matter of fact, the characteristics, the characteristics that uh, Je Jefferson will use, well, you know what, they do better in the sun than we do, and they're hardier in the sun, and they, you know, they don't think so much, but you know what, they get, they're contented if you pay them. I mean, so he has this kind of, if you pay them their food, uh, they have this notion of characters, and you know, any kind of racial joke uh, and stereotype, you know what I'm talking about, and we have all been part of that or it was fueled by the energy of European commercial exploitation. Through the 1700s, and now we're talking about Linnaeus and Blumenbach, who gives us the expression Caucasian, and you're talking about Jefferson. Uh, Linnaeus is 1757, and uh, Thomas Jefferson is 1780. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is in the same particular period. During the 1800s, to build on this kind of a pseudoscience where biology places in the surface of social apologetics hierarchy for economic and politics. And we'll see this again specifically with Mr. Jefferson, and I apologize to Mr. Jefferson again. Polygenism and monogenesis parallels cultures or uses of blacks for economics and labors. Monogenesis very simply is the Christian Bible gives, actually not even the Christian Bible, it was the Jewish Bible, uh, gives the story, a creation story of Adam, Adama and Eve, Ladam the man and Eve the woman. Um, and polygenism is now the theory that buttresses white supremacy and buttresses, in fact, enslavement, because the question then became, back with Elizabeth I, who were these people that we're finding? You go back to Shakespeare's The Tempest and Caliban and On the Island and, you know, oh, marvelous new world with such people in it, which is an ironic expression, given the context. 
So polygenism is this notion of, well, there must have been many Genesis. And uh, so the question of who was in the garden with, with Eve was a, a real question. I mean, there were, never there were never practical reasons thinking that Adam was not faithful, but the question of was that the snake variously portrayed various different kinds of, um, quote, pre-Adamic kinds of persons, uh, animals and other kinds of humans, uh, and I, I blush to just go repeat through all of it. Caucasian becomes a key category in about 1780, 1795, and it simply originally refers to, to the mountains. And he talks about that this is where the beautiful people were, and, and so that the be most beautiful people are these kinds of people. But, and later, the word Caucasian begins to include all the ancient, most modern populations of Europe. The aboriginal inhabitants of West Africa, at West Asia, that may surprise folks, including the Phoenicians, Hebrews and Arabs. Again, this gets changed according to particular political need. This is a very interesting, and this will probably knock people's socks off if you're wearing socks. Uh, 1770, a, a portrait painted on, on a uh, pharmacy door. You have an image of the garden, and you have a seated male, Adam, Adama. You have a standing woman, um, excuse me, is she black? You have over here, you have mirroring this, you have a couple, um, maybe, or a woman and a child, maybe. But it, it, it looks, it puts into play representations of common origins, monogenesis, which soon were abandoned to the social and economic advantages of a hierarchical concept of race difference. He's sitting, she's standing. So the primordial couple differs in skin color from a white Adam and a black Eve. Humans with other skin colors would follow. In the contemporary context of an already ongoing practice of colonization of the Americas, by which point it, which we, we, the, first, um, uh, the first Spanish enslaved person hit north uh, the, the Georgia coast in 1526. So we've had it 200 years at this particular point as well as the practice of slave trade and enslaved ownership. The, the, domination, the dominion of white over black was gendered as well. It was not arbitrary to paint Eve and not Adam with black skin. Um, the Confederacy, and this is the first part of the series of that, the Confederacy will use this, um, the pre-Adamite, to exploit and to, to guarantee the, 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 quote, Christian duty in terms of enslavement. Uh, 1871, Darwin somewhat humorously addresses polygenism, and he notes the great difficulty naturalists had in trying to decide how many races there were. Quote, man has been studied more carefully than any other animal, and here it's important that we understand that we are human animals according to Linnaeus, which is really the first time, and being able to call human an animal, prize, Linnaeus prized that language away from Aristotle and kind of the church's position that Adam and Eve, whatever else they were, were not animals. Well, that's, so we owe this to Linnaeus. And yet he said there's the greatest diversity among capable judges whether he should be classified as a single species or race or two or three or four, five, six, seven, eight, 11, 15, 16, 22, 60, 63. The diversity of judgment does not prove that the races ought not to be ranked as species, but it shows that they graduate into each other and that it's hardly possible to discover distinctive characterizations and characters between them. 1871. His wry observation makes clear white wasn't always the thing, and conceptually the term white has little to do with biology. What it has to do with is its functions and its practice, its use as a descriptor to evaluate position and place. These next few slides look at it specifically in the colonial period. So for the first century of, of British colonization, and I point out earlier that in 1526, uh, the Spanish brought enslaved persons from Africa. It wouldn't call it, uh, we, they would not call it Africa. Um, African nationals would not call themselves 
Africa, and they might call themselves Ghana and Nigerian. A Africa was the colonial term for it. But British colonization in the pre-colonies, white never appeared a describing term. In colonial press and law, you'd hear European, you'd hear Christian, you'd hear English. You know, this is a, I sang an example that I use, saying, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Englishman in New York. That's kind of the way that persons would think about this. I'm, I'm a good, you hear the expression, I'm a good Christian person, blah, 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 blah. This was the language that would be used, and it really wasn't until the 1705 that Virginia got around to this, uh, putting the term white into law, which we will see. Here's a refresher history. So as white race or white people begins to enter the major European languages in the later 17th century, as a response to the fact that they are, they are now in places and seeing persons who are not in any kind of way, in any way, shape, form, who could be considered as um, maybe white, in the context of racialized enslavement and unequal social status in the European colonies. And here, we, again, we pause. Uh, enslavement is not new to the human race. The specific cycle of it that we're talking about here in terms of European colonialism um, was going on at this, along at the same time that the Islamic uh, uh, race enslaved trade, from which we get the word Slav, because that was where the Islamics were then taking their slaves. So just to put it into a longer term, that we're speaking of very, a very specific and narrow kind of enslavement that we call chattel, and that was largely funded by Christian and European colonialists there. Uh, it's occasionally found in Greco-Roman ethnography and other ancient medieval sources, but these societies did not have a notion of a white or pan-human race, uh, pan-European race. Uh, Rome, for example, a good 25% of, uh, of its citizens were enslaved persons, just by definition. Um, Aristotle, we erased this from Aristotle, who's, who's, who said, you know what, you can think of children as almost human, and the persons who were like themselves uh, barbarians or the person slightly below that, and these would be the persons that we call enslaved. Scholarship on race distinguishes the modern concept from all this, which focuses on physical complexions. So the history that we're talking here is an archaeology of a culture. And it thinks about Queen Elizabeth, and I use the insularity here, and I talk, I talk about, we're going to see a slide here on Hawkins, one of her first slavers. We're thinking of the, the Iberian Empire in 1440 when they land in Ghana and see, number one, there are persons here uh, who uh, are already enslaved persons. Uh, and then there's this thing that they called Ghana or gold or Guinea, which later uh, King George and uh, King James II, or, Charles, sorry, um, when he talks about the, the founding the, the Royal African Society, uh, which, making, which made New York the stock market, uh, with livestock being the human being, and Cromwellian subjugation of Ireland. So the history of color signified moral differences, moral meanings. It came to signify them because those moral meanings could have political meanings. So. To, um, to go back into the current debate about the access of a certain kind of medical procedure. Uh, one sees all the way through it the, the question of morality, 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 or as a matter of fact, the people who are using that particular expression are referring to a very different kind of, they're using morality because they know that it sells. And so it's the, so the colonial justifications, for example, in the 1500s, and if you know your Shakespeare, go back and uh, look at um, The Tempest and this kind of this first Shakespearean kind of very uh, post-colonial exploration of who are these people and what are we doing with them and um, we can turn into play and we can teach it in high school and forever miss the cogency of what Shakespeare is doing. Cromwellian subjection of the Irish in 1650s, a free white person, Cromwellian sent, and uh, it was you know, under Christian theory that in the captured in war, uh, the, enslaved, the soldiers could be enslaved, and they were sent to the colonies as enslaved persons. There's a story that they uh, told about Jim, um, I, if you've heard me elsewhere on this story, pardon me, 1636, a man named uh, John Punch, um, um, a, 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 an African national who was brought in, enslaved with two European nationals, Irish, 
also enslaved. They all escaped together. Uh, they were returned to their master. The court of law gave the African national um, Vita Durante, enslavement for life, which is the first time that in Virginia law they have this. The two enslaved Irish, who were here and they had seven year enslavement terms, added, were added for three years. So the question of who the enslaved person was, either was white or indigenous or mulatto, it, Europe, Virginia during this particular period, 1660 through 1700, is sorting this out by law and it gets very messy. And the Protestant ascendancy by which uh, uh, the English uh, essentially took over and disrupted, um, uh, let's say, the, the Irish clans and family and systems. So the question is what biology is for. It's, we go back to, to geopolitics of Genesis, dominion, dominion, dominion. Uh, the piece in red here is the expression that the National Gallery of Art has for, for Sir John Hawkins, uh, Elizabethan slaver, 1563, who captures a Portuguese boat and takes the enslaved from them. This is what the museum says about this. Sir John Hawkins was a merchant, sea captain, ship owner, and one of the first English people involved in the transatlantic slave trade. After running private ships in the Anglo-French War, 1557, Hawkins had made several voyages to the Canary Islands where he heard about the possibilities of trading slaves from the west coast of Africa. On his first voyage, he took 300 enslaved Africans across the Atlantic to sell in Spain's Caribbean colonies. Pause. These later come to the states, the, the colonies, the, the Georgia coastline in 1526. Further attempts raised large profits. Such sizable returns resulted in Queen Elizabeth I providing financial backing for his subsequent voyages. Hawkins served as rear admiral of the fleet, raised against the Spanish Armada. He died off the coast of Puerto Rico whilst on expedition with his cousin, Sir Francis Drake. What a difference a few years makes. If you want to try to go now in the John Hawkins and find this in the museum, one would not. No mention is made over here uh, or in most other places in terms of being absolutely centered in terms of dominance and privilege, in terms of what kind of people it's worth talking about and what kinds of things are worth talking about, private ships and uh, trading and trading and more, more trading. Um, I don't use the expression transatlantic slave trade for that same reason, that it simply eliminates the agency of the persons who are actually doing this, um, Britain and Spain and Portugal. So the context that the first term white, well, I've already said this, 1613 appears in a play, The Triumphs of Truth, when the character of an African king looks out upon an English audience and declares, I see amazement set upon the faces of these white people, wondering in strange gazes. Middleton's play is the earliest printed example of a European author in that. The OED says the first appearance in print of the adjective white referencing a white man, person of a race, distinguished by light complexion is 1671. It functions as an adjective, not a noun. Colonial charters and other official documents written in the 1600s, 1700s, rarely referred to European colonialists as white. Very quickly here, we talked a bit, a bit about the Tempest. And it's at the dawn of the British Empire and it draws on information about the Virginia settlement, the shipwreck near Bermuda of the colonial governor. It's an extraordinarily interesting story. And I'm sorry to say it was more interesting than the way it was taught me in school. So the, 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 the dynamics of Caliban's enslavement and the ironic reference to a brave new world makes the Tempest a key text in the story of empire and subsequent uh, post-colonialism. Um, this is a woman over here who are two little interesting biological facts. She, she wore white uh, lead, lead uh, face paint to uh, block her uh, smallpox um, uh, uh, scars and they always talk about her teeth because that they were so bad. Well, why did Queen Elizabeth have so much bad teeth? Because as a matter of fact, they had discovered sugar in Caribbean. And so if everyone talks about how certain kinds of people had certain kinds of bad teeth. Um, the trade a product, whether it was liquor or, or, or uh, coffee or sugar or cotton, that to this day, uh, if, if one is a, 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 
a African, I'm sorry, is a, a black activist, one does not wear cotton and or eat sugar because these are quote the, the colonialist crops. So here you see the moor, and you see the light skin. Um, anyone need anyone need to see the, the dominance here? So, so in exactly the same time, in 1619, there were no white people listed in colonial records. Would not be for another 60 years. The concept of a white race was established between 1675 and 1700, and again, to distinguish between the persons who were living, the plantation owners in Virginia, and the persons who, how do you say it politely, were, were dragged in, flown in by Cromwell, or through ships to, to serve as um, indentured servants, which is what they were called. The word enslaved becomes first legally found in print in 1641. So whites only separatist laws begin here. In 1691, some say 1681, the Virginia colony passed and enforced the first law against voluntary marriage between free individuals of Europe and free individuals of African ancestry. And let's put a pause right on the free individuals of African ancestry. Even in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, uh, as late as the, the turn of the 20th century, these persons were segregated. So, quote, a free individual of African ancestry really is, a, again, another incoherent expression. When the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, against their will, there were no white people there, nor, according to the colonial records, would there be for another 60 years. Uh, and I take, I take a little issue here with this particular date because by 1619, there had already been a 125 year history on the East Coast of enslavement, not only of black persons, but also, and primarily of, of the indigenous, Ameri indigenous first peoples. Um, and none of this is, I'm not making this up, one can find any of this. So as we think about redeveloping and re-examining um, the black-white uh, polarity around, and, and the, the way we talk about it, we need to understand uh, the numbers of people who need to be part of this conversation uh, that we are not putting in there. But Alan's offhand observation reflects the fact after 20 years of studying Virginia's colonial records, he found no instance until 1619. A Alan explains, others living in the colony at the time were English. They'd been English when they left England. Naturally, they and their Virginia-born children were English. They were not white. White identity had to be taught. It would be another six decades until the word white would appear as a synonym for European, a synonym for European American. And we'll see that in a minute. Um, again, I'm talking fast. I know that there's a lot here, so we just gotta move right on. Nor was Britain alone in its early throes of empire as it sorts out those who could be described as human, even as the colonists came upon the use of white rather late. The Iberians, Portugal, Spanish uh, empire, began distinguishing their others from within in the same kind of way, from 1400s, Iberian, uh, Spain, and Portugal. Their ideas of limpeza de sangre, clean or pure blood, attributed to Isabella and Ferdinand, royal dictators, relating to lightest skinned Christians from Europe, Germanic Visigoths, Ostrogoths, the Goths or Anglo-Goths, and all of these persons were the persons who sacked finally the, the Roman Empire, at least they whittled it out from within. So this is a direct antecedent to Virginia's 1705 race formation, which we'll see, with its one-drop emphasis. It's a shift away from religion to ancestry. Uh, the expression, for example, limpesia de sangre, you know the expression we use when we don't want to be racist, but we want to talk about race. Blue blood, yep. All right. But the term white was a latecomer to the taxonomic policies of empire. Converts from Judaism, conversos, converts from Islam, morescos. Why were they converts? Because they were killed if they weren't. Commonly leveled accusation was that the new Christians were false converts, secretly practicing their former religion. Well, um, I understand that. The concept of purity of blood focused more on ancestry than personal religion. However, incoherent, because what one's seeing here is the development again of the, what we would call the, the protocols of nationalism of the nation state. 
the Virginia General Assembly Declaration, by the way, if one wants to have a, uh, an enlightening half hour or an hour reading some astonishingly uh, race-based laws, go to any part of the Virginia set of, of constitutions or laws. There's this one. All servants imported and brought into the country, use the word export or indentured servants, this is the word that's used in the Constitution. All servants imported and brought into the country who are not Christians, parentheses mine, white, in their native country, shall be accounted and be slaves. All Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves within this dominion shall be held to be real estate. If any slave resists his master, and you can remember the language of master, lord, master, correcting such a slave, and such shall happen to be killed in such a correction, the master shall be freed of all punishment as if such accident never happened. It's an astonishing law. The point, again, is that all of these other persons in some kind of way suffered from the one drop. So if you were registering the 20th century a, a birth in Virginia, you would have two blocks, two boxes, white, black. But the Virginia colonists, planters all, are merely replicating here earliest separatist protocols developed by Britain colonialists in India and an astonishing violence and near home in the years of conquest of Ireland. Well, here's where I do my, my off off the cuff remark it's going to get me into trouble uh, i'm still wondering how the united kingdom has gotten away with very little discussion about its own enslavement practices i know what they have it um, but there is one of the things i've said before is that uh, in in the colonies and in, in the united states and quote the new world we live in the mess that that our history gives us um, and for much of uh, the uk's uh, colonial history uh, their, their depredations happened someplace else. So they left messes for other people. So the colonial economics of white, for the Brits, at first for the Asian peoples, and then the Irish uh, of subjugation and control. And I know that probably in history, you read periods about the Protestant ascendancy and how, and how uh, anybody who was a Catholic in, in Ireland was forbidden citizenship, was forbidden own property, was forbidden, was forbidden, forbidden. You're going, oh, this sounds very much like the new age, I mean, the new country race laws. Yep, very similar. Um, a very recent book, or recent to me at least, looks at the use of violence central to the spread and maintenance of the British Empire. And um, I'm shocking. T it's a shocking book, and I won't, I won't tell you much about it. Um, I, I certainly won't quote from it. The Middle East and the Pacific included 700 million people in Queen Elizabeth II in 52. These practices still continue, of course. 2011 national census in England and Wales are not offered the option of including English or Welsh as part of their ethnic group identity. According to British officialdom, English and Welsh are white only terms. I'm, we're just, just talking about Virginia law, so it's not, it, this is just not one particular country. And in the U.S. still, now the next couple of slides give you some basically uh, headlines from different areas about becoming white. Irish immigrants in the American 19th century. Um, you know the signs, you've seen them. Uh, job hunting, no Irish native line, no black Irish. The question, the point I've made out in other places, uh, the difficulty with being Irish in, uh, let's say, New York or in the country, um, they, were, they, were, they started off as enslaved and they remained enslaved. The reason that we have gay bars was, or not gay bars, but Irish pubs, because that was the equivalent to a gay bar. These kinds of people could find their place there where they would be safe. You don't have Polish pubs, you don't have these other sorts of things. So. Haney Lopez, White by Law, an astonishing book. The not quite so white Europeans after 1889 immigration to the U.S. from Southern and Eastern Europe swells dramatically. Many of the new arrivals are ethnics, employed in undesirable low-wage jobs like building a transcontinental railroad uh, and living in the urban ghetto, like the African, Mexican, and Chinese Americans performing unskilled industrial labor, but not quite seen as white. 
And so reflecting this view, uh, Ripley publishes The Races of Europe, dividing whites into a distinct hierarchy of sub-races, and even the degraded Hebrew, so and Italian are still legally white. So Haney argues, the whole concept of becoming white had been an obsession with many in the US. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant is the wasp. This is so-called melting pot, an assimilation process of Anglicization, and as we perfectly well know, if one is melted down, one, is not, one does not maintain one's own whatever one is. And it's not necessarily race-based, but if you possess a certain kind of physical characteristic from Europe, you have an advantage at being accepted as being white. So honorary wasps in U.S. include assimilated immigrant Caucasian European race groups, hyphenated Americans, again, I go back to um, I go back to Morrison's great line is that uh, white is for America, the rest of us are hyphenated. To a lesser degree, the following, multiracial Americans who possess predominantly physical characteristics from Europe, educated black Americans to include black African, black British, Western Indian, Anglicized, educated Hispanic Latinos, uh, First Peoples, Anglicized Eastern Indians, and Asians. Okay. Just three random headlines from the bottom two are uh, the New York Times over the years. How Jews became white folks and what that says about race in America, and, and one can turn to see the marvelous Miss Moselle, uh, 1950s uh, kind of uh, I Love Lucy, if you want to put it that way, set in New York. Uh, and while there's lots of chuckles about it, but uh, it is exactly this. It's, it's how, it's demonstrating how a certain group of persons uh, assume the burden the drag of white, if you want to put it that way. Whiteness on trial. By the way, and, you know, my husband loves uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, and, and it goes on and on about it as gender is drag. And, and, and while I have lots of theoretical problems with the way the thing is presented, one has to understand that, that, that race is a kind of drag also in the way that we're talking about it here. Whiteness on trial, Asian Americans and the right to citizenship. Um, the, the, the laws steadily through the 1800s, really until about the 20th century, on Asian people and citizenship are astonishing. And uh, I think we probably have erased many of those kinds of things from our own head. Um, most recently from the, from the New York Times, how Italians became white, vicious bigotry, a reluctant acceptance, an American story. Uh, and did you know that this is why we got Columbus Day? Well, that's how we did. Uh, a kind of a short way to understand this better than what I'm doing is race the power of an illusion through PBS. Courts decide who is white through the 20s. The 1790 Naturalization Act restricts naturalized Americans citizens to whites. In the early 20th century, many new arrivals petitioned the courts to be legally designated white in order to gain citizenship. Armenians, Asiatic Turks, Succeed with Franz Boas, who testifies as an expert scientific witness. Others are not so fortunate. In 1922, the Supreme Court concludes that Japanese are not legally white because science classifies them as mongoloid rather than Caucasian. A year later, the court contradicts itself, concluding that Asian Indians are not legally white, even though science classifies them as Caucasian. Instead, declaring that whiteness should be based, quote, on the common understanding of the white man. Okay, well, there is your unmarked center. Uh, this other person is a hyphenated person, and I'm an American. Racial restrictions on naturalization are not removed until 1954. And there's still other ways of making them happen. Okay. So how did Europeans use the theory of white to explain, justify, and consolidate practices of empire colonialism? White race dominance and colonial empire exist in symbiosis. One cannot separate these two. Empire depended on the creation of race and gender and maintained the maintenance of race hierarchy in order to exploit dominance for economic purposes. The word Christian is not anywhere in that particular first paragraph, but it should be. Or at least understand it, that when we start talking about colonialism, we need to understand we're talking about Christianity of, in its varieties of forms, not just one specific. 
but it's usually the term that's left out. So Deus Volt, God wills it. Pope Urban I calls for the First Crusade. So when you think about the just war and, and God, want, God wills it, we think of this as Islamic. It's not. Uh, Miranda in The Tempest, Miranda to be amazed and surprised and bewildered. Colonialism is a form of imperialism based on a divine mandate designed to bring liberation. It's always easy to liberate somebody who is less fortunate than you are, isn't it? Spiritual, cultural, economic, political. By sharing the blessings of the Christ-inspired civilization of the West with a people suffering under satanic oppression, ignorance, and disease. <coughs> Sorry. Affected by a combination of political, economic, and religious forces that cooperate under a regime seeking the benefit of both the rule and the ruled. Here is where I could talk about um, Belgium and the Congo Empire, uh, which um, 15 million people were slaughtered. But, uh, we could talk about any number of uh, the, the, what happened in the Caribbean. We could talk about what happened to the indigenous persons in the United States. We could talk about um, 1870 and uh, King George's Royal Proclamation, which says es essentially, this is indigenous first people land. And then went on to, the, the colonies went on to what they did. And it was King George, who, or King Charles II, who, who brought enslavement and made Washington, not Washington, made New York the center of it in the New World. So when we start thinking about, well, do you want to start naming, renaming the Duke of York and renaming Charlestown and renaming, et cetera. So a theory of white underlies Western colonial history. And this is uh, the benefit of both the ruler and the rules, as you see here. Invasion is not an event, it's a structure. Colonialism is when we go to another country and, and borrow their sugar or take their sugar or take their gold or whatever it is that we find valuable. Settler colonialism is when we go to another country, we take the sugar, we take their gold, we take whatever we find and we kill the people and live there ourselves. Immanuel Kant, now back to a professor at in, in philosophy and we were always having to parse out uh, Kant's uh, three great questions, and did we ever think about his quotes when he says that, quote, humanity is at its greatest perfection in the race of the whites, or his notes and lectures on anthropology that, quote, Native Americans and Negroes cannot govern themselves, they serve only as slaves. The, our language of race is enlightenment philosophy, and that this, this does manage to make people irritated when I say things like this, and then you have, again, back to Kant, uh, Kant dismisses a statement made by an African man in his comment, quote, this fellow was quite black from head to foot, a clear proof that what he said was stupid. And I asked the women in my class, uh, when you start talking about you know, enlightenment agency and uh, ethics and the agent who's doing the action, you're going, as a woman you had no moral agency and uh, certainly as a, a non-white European you had, as the, the person that, the, the boy that brought Jefferson his tea, Madison his, uh, say, it, say it, his enslaved son, it, it was not, uh, Jefferson was not writing the declaration for him. Okay. So to understand the theory behind whiteness, we have to go to the Enlightenment, we have to think about it, that it creates uh, modern race thinking, and you, there's no, this is not new to me, and um, while it might be hidden from many of us, it just takes a bit of work to look it up. So. And to return to an, to an earlier point, that the conquest of Ireland, race domination or empire, combined different kinds of colonial dominances, race, economic, religious, and social, and in the colonies, all of these became practiced and the, the race became the most. Colonial practice in the new world, race as economic necessity and therefore political strategy, practical excuse. Biology again, when someone comes at you holding their DNA and it says, oh, are you gonna send off your, your DNA to whatever the thing is, please do not do that, okay? Uh, beginning in the early years of colonial conquest, scientific racism was an apology for the prophets and the genocidal policies of colonialism. Biology repeatedly excuses, justifies, explains the blanket defense, destiny. Genesis misread gives permission for environmental side. 
So here we are. We've all been in this place. It's a solemn monument to a person who neither believed nor practiced what the monument says. Jefferson, quote, I advanced it, therefore, as a suspicion only, Jefferson was always covering his whatever, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time or circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowment of both body and mind. And in the same volume, page later, he notes, incorporating freed blacks into the states was out of the question, suicidal, because he surmises it will, quote, divide us into parties and produce convulsions, which will probably never end but in extermination of one or the other race. Jefferson will be quoted in nationalist and race apology as throughout the 19th century by political and civil leaders, Confederate as well as Union. The Jefferson Memorial, panel three. God who gave us life, gave us liberty. Mm, okay, maybe. Offers a quotation from his autobiography. It edits Jefferson on this point. It omits a crucial portion of Jefferson's point below in red. This is what the memorial says. Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free. What it eliminates and does not put in, nor is it less certain that the two races equally free cannot live in the same government. Nature, habit, opinion has drawn indelible lines of distinction between them. In 1863, when Lincoln called a group of um, black church leaders into the White House and laid out his plan for colonization uh, to Liberia, quote, he said, so that you would be able to return to your homes, a more, a poor paraphrase of what he said, and the church leaders looked at him with like, like, what are you thinking? This is our home, we've always lived in this home. So this notion, and actually the, uh, the state that we, that we now know as, as Colombia, there once was a, a motion out there to call it Lincolnia and to emigrate um, freed enslaved persons out of the U.S. to someplace else, and Lincolnia would have been the place. So moving along, race colonialism is still part of the practice of the new age of empire. The intellectual, political, and economic frameworks inherited from colonialism still govern today's world. So the grand narratives of the Enlightenment, we just talked about this a moment ago, about you know the agents of this and agents of that, and you look at Kant's racism and his, uh, his, uh, the, his effects on gender, and you go, um, why are we still teaching this to our undergraduates? We, we, better, we, better we keep the statues with them in museums and eliminate this as a concept, eliminate this as a curriculum. But Western linear progress and developmentalism offers a broader and more complete picture of the continuing problems of racism that we see here. And even the sale, of, and even the ending in 1808 of the, uh, quote, the transatlantic enslaved trade, um, which was kind of a bit of a bargain made out for the, for the Constitution. For, they said that they needed to do it, otherwise the South wouldn't sign. They, 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 knew, they knew what they were doing. Um, they use it as a kind of an excuse, but they, they, they were keeping the enslavement, they were keeping it, it made them a constitution. It also made them a lot of money. Its connection to African and first peoples and Hispanic descendants, enslaved descendants remained. Boosted by the Louisiana Purchase, why is, why is uh, Jefferson in 1803 buying up all this land? Because they want to move west, because they're now exporting not cotton, but uh, enslaved persons. They seize American Indian lands. A new internal slave trade reinvigorates enslavement. Well, what do we mean by that? Even Jefferson understood this. In 1819, a few years before his death, he worries about an increase in infant mortality among his enslaved. He writes, it's for moral as well as interested considerations. By the way, if you've ever signed a contract for a house, you know, it'll say X, X, X considerations. Considerations is the legal term meaning um, money, if something is something of some value is being exchanged. So it's moral as well as interested considerations that overseers should preserve slaves' lives not for their labor but their increase. This is our friend Thomas Jefferson. 
and you see Thomas Jefferson's handwriting over here, and you see um, his uh, his never his wife, but his what do you call her? His she's certainly not not even a mistress. She's an enslaved woman that he's I, what's the word? I don't I don't I don't have a word for it. Jefferson notes that he has made a significant profit every year from his birth of slave children. Quote, I allow nothing for losses by death, but on the contrary shall presently take credit, 4% per annum for their increase over and above keeping up their numbers. His enslaved persons were yielding him a perpetual Schumann dividend at compound interest. That's why he could sign the bill in 1808, because you know what? Um, one thing that we'll go through in my walk in Washington this week, about a half a million, about 12 million uh, Ghanaian, Nigerian, West Coast uh, African men, women, and children were captive and brought by ship across the Atlantic. Uh, about f probably two million of them would have, would, have, would have died on the journey. About a half a million, maybe 500,000, probably came into the then the colonies directly. Other, most others went to Brazil and to different places. But from 1800 through the founding of Washington, D.C., through 1860, the fourth census, probably a million black Americans, and I call them Americans because they were born here, black Americans, men, women, and children, were passed through Washington, D.C., north to south, south to north. Nowhere do you see that in Washington, D.C. So polygenesis and the burden of civilization again. So from Noah's curse to, to a rationale for slavery, that we know the story, we think we do, that one of the children of Noah saw his father drunk and doing whatever he was doing or not doing, uh, and the father curses him as, uh, as the one who is sent out. And so Ham becomes one of the, is the, the, the burden of blackness. Okay. Um, I don't have time now to go through this. Sometimes look up pre-Adamite. The, the notion that a different way of going back to thinking the Bible is that it wasn't Ham's fault that uh, all these things happened, but that there are these other kinds of people out there that are pre-Adamites. Where did they come from? And you can kind of see that they were, it's a two-seed line. It's just that the sons of Noah had been white. And this creates a problem regarding non-white races. So his solution is to suggest that the Negro is a pre-Adamic beast of the field, some kind of higher order of monkey, and, and by the way, this was fairly, this was heterodox um, Confederate thinking. Payne's solution was to suggest that the Negro is a pre-Adamite preserved on Noah's Ark. According to Payne, they were a separate species without immortal souls. So when you hear various, um, and they talk about the shootings in Christchurch, you talk about the two C theologies uh, governing white supremacy, even to the, the the killings in, in a number of different places. So this kind of wonky theology is, is what, which is why some of the, the white supremacist killings end up uh, being aiming at a certain kind of synagogue uh, and others aim at um, different sorts of places. The, the reason it is here is, in other words, who is, who is in the garden with, the, with Adam? So the colonial model of enslavement in the Chesapeake system, three-part, we got this from the, from the Spanish, the, the Spanish board, the Creoles, the Mestizos and Indians, and African slaves. <coughs> Sorry. In Virginia, the only one who would count as a member of the society is the Peninsulares, the, the ones who were born in the state and who were pure blood. The rest of these particular persons were what we would now call um, uh, victims of the white, uh, sorry, of the one drop. You begin to see here in these other kinds of images uh, that the Spanish system made it possible for mixed blood persons to actually become part of the, of the society. Um, in Virginia and the colonies, and uh, even from Massachusetts all the way down, um, being mixed blood, you were, you were kept out of society. Um, Buying white, so white was and still is a valued commodity, and I know that we're moving on here. Something like that, that all the way through different societies, there were ways of thinking about how one could buy a, a legal term of whiteness to get rid of the effect you suffered with from birth. 
And again, just to see that we're, this is what we're talking about. So the, the sense of European entitlement evidenced in our first law months into the new country, confirmed and reconfirmed in 300 years of colonial practice. Practice is an important word here. Law needs practice. These are not, uh, laws are sustained by individuals who do the practice, who do the thing. In 1790, not long after the ratification, whites only, and again, free white person, and one thinks again, maybe we didn't think about this before today, but what is all those words doing there in that kind of a line of person? And who's defined as person? Because as a matter of fact, uh, we know that uh, Jefferson's six children weren't persons, and the, the woman he was having sex with, can, can one say that? Uh, I don't want to use any of the kind of the more, um, well, there's the language, but what was he doing? Who knew? All right. So the most influential ideology in our nation's history is a religiously saturated fantasy called Manifest Destiny, and it goes back to Pope Urban I and uh, Dei Oswald, God wills it. The individuality of Manifest Destiny calls for crusades and onto colonialism when Americans or the colonialists believe that they will be the example for the rest of the world. The expression manifest destiny as we have it comes out of an 1848 um, newspaper headline actually. Uh, when Americans believe they are destined by God to remake the world. It's always easy to believe that we, we're remaking the world when it is in fact, it's, it's true that history re rewrites the, re history is rewritten by those who are the victors of it. So you see here in this very famous uh, Lutz, uh, painting which is in the Const in, in the capital, 1861. Uh, you can see the Christian history over here. You can see the crush. You can see the, uh, the pioneers uh, completely erased, of course, and completely the genocide. The the seven to eight uh, million uh, indigenous first people born in this country uh, removed, killed, and enslaved. And while why more people aren't talking about those. The difference between the kind of the spurious kind of, um, oh well, these are Indian nations and we accord them a kind of privilege that we don't accord to, uh, um, how do we say it politely, immigrants from other countries or, or black Americans, we, we call them African Americans, but we, we, we don't treat them well. So we, the way we have uh, laid out the political terrain, this is the way the westward the course of not yet white empire the original 13 colonies, right here. All the rest of this was non-white. Most of it was Spanish and Mexican, okay? This was all French. Um, the Jesuits, by the way, have uh, recently put up a, a million dollar trust fund for their work on enslavement with the, with the French missions. So uh, they're doing their work. Uh, manifest destiny actually means manifest white, though a vast majority of the areas covered in all 50 states were inhabited by indigenous persons of, well, they're not quite so white, are we? No. So moving to an end over here, the process in the colonies is interesting. You, are, you have on the one hand the sentimental uh, benevolism and the enlightenment rhetoric of natural rights and Jefferson again with Madison giving him his tea. Madison, who, uh, the child that he would not give his freedom. Madison, uh, Jefferson never, where does he get the name Madison? From the president right after him who helped him get the election in 1800. You may know that story from current affairs. But so, and give us your poor and your downtrodden against a long drive of European exceptionalism. The Christian, the English who were manifestly destined for this country. Uh, and we're gonna end here today with the Statue of Liberty book. So you see this given in your poor and your downtrodden. So the tough knot, a need to import, quote, lower races, Africans, indigenous Asian, Mexican, into a growing slave Mexico economic, north and south. Um, with, there is very little justice being done to the Hispanic and Mexican citizens who in the 30s in California, a full 40% of, of, of persons re returned, repatriated, quote, was the word used, to Mexico were American citizens. Um, that prompts at the same time a need to separate these persons, separate them off from us as a word for property. And by the way, Mexicans were one of the few groups who were allowed in the 1924 uh, uh, Immigration Act because as a matter of fact, uh, they said, well, we need them to, for our work and if they pay a $10 tax, they can come in. So even then the money was clear. So the practical consequences of this, again, Senator James Hammond, 1858, this is a year after the Tawney Act. 
this is a senator on the floor of the Senate. I, I'm going to read it. It's, it's, it's just, I'm going to read it. In all social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties, to perform the drudgery of life. A class requiring but a low order of intellect and but little skill. By the way, this, these are Jefferson's words. Its requisites are vigor and facility, fidelity. Such a class you must have, or you wouldn't have any other class which leads to progress, civilization, and refinement. By the way, Jefferson said, and using this kind of language, he said, well, we breed up our dogs to be, to be beautiful. Why not our, our humans? It constitutes the very mud sill of society and of political government. And you might as well attempt to build a house in the air as to build either one or the other except on this mud sill. Fortunately for the South, she found a race adapted to that purpose to her end. Surely this man is being ironic. They didn't find them. They had to go. A race inferior to her own, but eminently qualified in temper, in vigor, in docility, in capacity to stand the climate, to answer to all their purposes. If they were so qualified in temper and in vigor and docility, why was there such great fear throughout the time of slave revolts and slave, and slave agencies? We used them for our purpose and we called them slaves. We found them slaves by the common, quote, consent of mankind, which according to Cicero, lex nature est, as the law, law is of nature. One wonders why the Civil War happened when it did. I don't. The early whitening of the rhetoric. Krupp Kerr, Letters to an American Farmer, 1782. When come these people? They're a mixture of English and Scots and Irish and French and Dutch and Germans and Swedes. Well, he's being optimistic with the Irish. From this promiscuous breed, that race now called Americans have risen. When then is the American, this new man? He's either a European or the descendant of a European, hence the strange mixture of blood which you'll find in no other country. 1782. There were 700,000 enslaved Americans in 1780, 1790, sorry. In 1860, at the census, there were 4 million, an 80% increase of enslaved persons. This according to the Constitution that said that enslavement was, was passing away. So Kreft himself was not English, or was not American. <coughs> He's actually French. Um, doesn't mention anything except the Europeans, and that's the point that I'm trying to make here. Europe, not England, is the parent country of America. This new world has been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. Well, partly the reason I point these texts out because this is what our children are receiving in school. I, you know, I have a degree in American studies, a PhD from Duke, and this is the kind of, this is how I was taught, and this is what for many years I taught. But even Europeans weren't free from race contempt. In the history of assimilating Irish and Jews and Italians and everybody make evident. Benjamin Franklin, petulant comments about Germans in Pennsylvania. Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them? They will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. Those who come hither are generally of the most ignorant, stupid sort of our own nation. They herd together and will soon so outnumber us that we will not, in my opinion, be able to preserve our language and even our government will become precarious. I wish the number of purely white people were increased. Well, there's some members of Congress that this man should meet, I think, at the moment. All right, I know that we're moving on. I'm going to just briefly, I don't think I need to repeat all of this. White nationalism is deeply American. The passing of the great race, the racial bias of European history, many of us are, are taught the great Gatsby in, in uh, school, and many of us taught it. And uh, the, the, he mentions, uh, this is 1920, and he mentioned this book. So whiteness is not simply anesthetic, and it's not simply color. It has meaning, intention, and archaeology. Tony Morrison remarks, in this country, America means white. Everyone else has to hyphenate. Description is evaluation. Very quickly. So in other words, again, it's not a new idea. It goes back to Greco and Roman and you a kind of a current, uh, you know, they have this man here who's playing Troy and everyone's getting all under the, uh, in, in, in twists because, uh, well, you know, he's this color, that color, and so. 
Nell Irvin Painter. So we're, we're talking not so much about the invention of a race, but the history of its use. Painter illuminates that in the invention of race, but also the frequent praise of whiteness for economic and scientific and political ends, Painter argues that the concept of race is an all too human invention whose meaning, importance, reality have changed as it has been driven by a long and rich history of events. If one were to say to Google, you know, the brown bag test or Google colorism, Google whiteness, made, whiteness making products, one might be surprised at what one finds. So the history of white is a different narrative than kind of what we're talking about over here. Painter writes, a ruling class quite easily judges the lower orders to be innately servile. More than a century before Aristotle discoursed on the naturalness of slavery and the inherently slavish nature of the enslaved in politics, and he does, we're not given that in school. So we had the same conversation differently with our four-legged cousins, our non-human animals. Oh, no, the dog likes its cage. Yeah, right? Yeah, oh yeah, no, the dog likes this. How do we know this? Oh, well, the dog likes being put on a leash. The dog likes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Darwin, and this is a quote, those whom we have made our slave, we do not like to think of as our equals. It wasn't until 1940 that the rules were changed to allow women of color into the Miss America pageant. And before that, the official rules stated contestants, quote, good health and the white race. That could have been right out of the 1790 First Naturalization Act. And I'm going to go very quickly on over here. Last three or four time that we have. Uh, okay, give me a few minutes. Um, Oscar nominations the past decade, 89% went to white people, 71% nominations went to men. No surprise. 74 total nominations over the past decade to people of color. In 2011 alone, 72 nomination to white creators. 2022 actors, 2009. Sports, 18% NFL head coach of people of color since 2011. 71% of the players in the NFL, people of color. Um, I include this because I think it's humorous. Nationalists are flocking to genetic ancestry tests and they don't like what they find and then they have to go through this kind of gender correction and this kind of identity correction. How white supremacists respond when their DNA says they're not white. It's really very humorous. So to end where we started, practice makes perfect. Whiteness is a practice. The baby who is born pink learns to become white. So we need to fa face whiteness it, both at individual and collective level. In the apologetics of empire, each of us learns and practices, even often against our will, even if not against our knowing. And I'm gonna pause here for a moment. We know the expression, the white man's burden. We know it because it's Rudyard Kipling. Maybe we did not know that. We did not know that Rudyard Kipling, that's a line from a poem by, by Rudyard Kipling, um, dedicated to the United States taking over the, uh, the empire or the, the, the state of the Philippines. So the language of the U.S. doesn't have an empire. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we are we are we are we are in our imperial mode. The apologetics of empire each of us learns, even to this day, and practices, even often against our will, even if not against our knowing. We'll hear things and say, "Oh, you know what? I'm not. You know, don't think of me as one of the girls. I'm really more like one of the guys." Or, you know, um, you know, my gay friends are quote or straightening up for for their, their parents or when their parents visit. I go, why are, we, why are we doing these kinds of work for people? Why are we carrying water for people who, as a matter of fact, do not have our best interests in mind? Um, and one could think of what's happening in the Supreme Court. Finally, axiom. So what is the pink baby learning even today? We don't have to call it racism. We call it something else. I want to thank everybody for joining this after, hot afternoon and all the learning we do, however we do it, is important. I want to thank especially Robert Kellerman, DC Cultural and History, who makes all of these presentations possible. 
Um, the background image here is the Statue of Liberty, um, Lady of Liberty, and you can see, maybe the first time you've seen it, the, the chains around her feet. Um, this statue was not about immigration. It was an abolitionist gift to the US. Um, Miss Lincoln was an enslaved person. Robert, I'm in your hands. Okay, Edward, thank you. That was awesome, as always. Let's see. So if anyone has any questions they would like Edward to answer or any additional comments, um, feel free to type those in the chat. And Patty and I will go through and take a look at those. And I'm sorry to talk so fast, but I managed to do all this in 90 minutes. Oh, it's okay, Edward. You can always take as long as you need. Oh, <laughs> Patty said that um, pink people reminds me of the old Crayola cram box with one that vaguely pinkish color labeled flesh. <laughs> oh, I wish I had that. It could I, be the I, vis I, visual I will, for next time. I will. I exactly will, and I'll give you credit. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Um, let's see. This was an interesting question from earlier that you ended up answering, but I wanted to read it to you. Um, I can't find it. Patty, did you see any questions that popped up? Well, what I was seeing in the questions is that as deeply as, as you've gone into this, Ed, and developed it, um, it, so much of this is so deeply ingrained that a, a lot of us have trouble grasping all of it at one time. Is that making any sense? It makes all the absolutely. And that's what I saw coming out of the um, the questions. Let me see if I can find any. That's why, that's why I ended this with the practices that we make perfect ourselves. And I used the example about uh, how we apologize for our social state, you know, whether, uh, you know, I'm not really one of the women, I'm one of the guys, and I'm, you know, I'm not really gay, I'm this, that, the other thing. or. Uh, and you can see it in the advertisement around certain kinds of uh, um, vaccines that they are being given now. There's, there's a certain way of talking around it that's really very peculiar. And you, one might not be paying attention to it, but uh, you're right. There's a whole lot here. And boy, yeah, and it, it's one of those things that, that so much of what people are hearing and dredging up within themselves, it's not so much an either or or a clear cut um explanation but it's the complexity that makes it so bizarre right i agree that's very, very good you should be teaching him one of these yourself <laughs> well thank I'm you working on it <laughs> it's flattering friend, friend robert he'll get she'll set you right up <laughs> we're, we're working on it there was a question earlier you kind of answered it um later in the program someone said um why were interracial marriages outlawed if the people still had children together and I'm like well that's kind of two different things marriage is one thing and um the activity that leads to children is something Robert, the, maybe you know, they were different it's the thing that you used to say about queer people I and mean, we don't care what you do in private you know it's it's what's it's what you do in public uh, jefferson never legally put a, however much he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote um and the he had a whole wing in, in, in Monticello for the children in his, in, of his own, um, his, own, his own children. He never legally freed them. He never, he never paid any attention to them, never announced them at any kind of level. So uh, if there is a race dynamic in this particular country, it's the white plantation owners who were the ones, I'll say it, uh, who were taking their ways with other persons. And so when uh, Jefferson, pr President Jefferson, uh, pr sorry, President Roosevelt, the f Fort Teddy said, well, lynching's not gonna end until the, f the, the 4,000, you know, rapes of white, you know, virtuous women. Or, you know, I, sorry, man, this is not the case. 
So, I mean, the, uh, yeah, Wilkerson's book, uh, Case, looks at the, what she calls the seven pillars of, uh, of Case, and, and uh, exogamy is one of them. Keeping people like them outside the, 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 the society of the standard. And in Virginia, remember, Virginia is the country, is the state that when the Supreme Court said 67 segregate the schools, Virginia shut down their schools. Here is a question. Let me read the question, then I'll give my response. Then I'll, you can tell us you think. Someone um, said, you don't think highly of DNA testing, but there is benefit to finding our ancestor origins, question mark. I didn't take it that way at all. I, he didn't say, in my opinion, Edward, that you didn't, weren't in favor of DNA tests. What, you were, what I was heard from you was you were talking about, it's interesting that people are kind of trying to sometimes erase the results or change well, the results. I, did, I, did, I never heard anything where you said you were opposed to DNA testing. No, you were just I, talking I, about that. I am not. I'm careful. I'm careful. I wouldn't, if you're not going to give away your social security number, you're not going to give away this number. Um, uh, I'm going to make a reference here now to say monkeypox uh, vaccines. Um, I'll just say it this way. The number, when one, vac when one gets this kind of, one is asked to fill out all kinds of serious kinds of questions. And it was like when they cremated my uncle and the, one of the questions I was, well, uh, how many years of higher education did this man have? You're looking at this form and you're saying, how many of these kinds of questions are even pertinent to why these people are sitting in this particular room? Oh, yeah. so, I understand what, what, the, what she was saying, it was uh, Naomi. Um, you know, I don't, to contradict Edward, I don't mind sharing my DNA with <laughs> something I wouldn't got the test and I don't, doesn't bother me. And I know there's a big thing about, well, what happens if one of your aunts, what if your relatives is a murderer or something? You know, I don't care. Um, so everyone's entitled to their opinion. So the fun thing is, is, is the white supremacists who basically have to apologize to their, to their people because they, it's like they're, they have failed their identity and find, need, need to figure out some way to recoup it. Yeah. I like that's then, a good um, putting it in. Oh yeah, no, that's excellent. A few people asked about sharing the slides, and unfortunately, we don't really have a way to do that um, in like a file, but you can watch the, this is being recorded, it'll be put on our YouTube page, right. and so you can always go through it that way, but unfortunately, we don't have a way to, with the types of people that, how they RSVP, we don't have a way to like send out files like this, unfortunately, so sorry about that, but it, we'll put the recording on YouTube. It probably won't be till tomorrow or maybe even Tuesday though, and then we'll send out the link. But yeah, for, for Edward, for whatever reason, this was like the number one presentation you did that people were asking about the slides, like, oh, how can I get the slides? How can I get the slides? Yes. We get those once in a while, but for whatever reason, this one, there were a lot of people asking about that, so that's interesting. Thought, and, and, the, and the environment, that's always, always the one, one people like too. The, um, so this weekend, for those who are interested, there's going to be two, um, I don't want to call them tours because they're not tours. Um, I, I call them for the National Gallery a, a, a procession. I mean, they're more, uh, I, I try to be more reverential about them, but there's going to be one in Georgetown uh, and one in Washington or the Federal District. One's on Saturday and one's on Sunday. Robert has that information and he will pass that out. Uh, they're about an hour long, hour and a half a piece. Uh, and it's usually a few block walk, and um, and we're doing it at ten o'clock in the morning because it's going to be cooler. Yeah, hold on one second, and I'll pull that info up. Okay. And in the meantime, um, and I don't know if this would be something you'd want to consider, but I think there there is so much depth in most of these questions that have been asked during this that. To me, and I don't know if this would work for you, um, you could basically split this tape in two, run it in two different programs, and take some of these questions during the program, because this stuff is so complex that my sense is people um, really want to go into a bunch of different aspects of what you covered in more depth. Right. And uh, Patty, what I do, I do teach these. Um, and uh, hello, what happened over this? I do teach these in classes, and I usually between sections would stop, but there's no way unless we stop at those sections and let Robert field questions then. I could easily do that. Yeah, that's what I mean, though. What if we split this up and you were still present, but we were running, so that way you wouldn't have to be talking the whole time, and we could 
you know, stop it at different places where people um, have questions relevant to that specific area that you're talking about. Do you see what I'm saying? Sounds good to me, Robert. Next time up, every time there's a section, there's a section heading in my cl my classes when I teach this material. A section heading is where I stop and pause. Okay, no, that's fine. We can take a look at that. Thanks, Patty. Um, let's see. I so I pulled up on the screen. Edward is hosting these two historical walks um, next weekend. Uh, and oh, so this, sorry, this. Um, screenshot here doesn't have the date. So let me do this. I'll post those in the chat. Edward, why don't you give us a sneak preview for people that are going to be are in Washington, D.C. and able to come down. What will you be doing on these two walks? Well, I th um, there's a there's a four block section. My point earlier that I said that one million black Americans in chains were moved through Washington, D.C. And the reason of the founding of Washington as a as a power of slavery. The reason the district does not have uh, still representation, as, is, as one of the police says, it, it's, it's the last plantation in the, in the United States. That Washington was founded to be a place where, this, where the Southern persons, the Southern people kept their, their land. Uh, Jeff, Jefferson and Washington, they were, these, these guys were money makers and they had farms and plantations right near that's why they have it where it is uh georgetown is is a is 150 years older than the district and uh, enslaving indigenous persons from as early as 1631. yeah so edward's tours are this coming saturday august 13th and this coming sunday august 14th hey, so scott. saturday scott. august 13th cause says scott uh, he's going to come from scotland Thank you, Carl. <laughs> That's awesome. Edward, don't you still give away a prize to the person that traveled the furthest? Oh, no, no I'm just kidding. I didn't. <laughs> did before COVID. But anyway, um, Saturday, August 13th is a tour of Georgetown, or a walk, I should say. Uh, and then Sunday, August 14th is a walk, historical walk of the National Mall. And so the, the topics are kind of similar, but they're different. So some people go to one or the other, some people go to both, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a question. Um, when you spoke of um, drag, racial drag, I immediately thought of minstrel shows. Is that the sort of thing you were referring to? I, I, no, I'm in, in an updated context, I'm, I'm talking about white people drag. Okay, but would minstrel shows have been an example of, of uh, a sort of racial drag? Or is that something different? This, this is why in, in, in a in a different generation, gay students would not uh, wear, would not, um, how do I put it this way? That straight, well, straight boys would not paint their toenails, nor would they wear pink shirts. So in other words, we're talking, when I talk about drag, whether it's race drag or gender drag, when Marlena Dietrich, she can, she, she can don a, a coat, or Madonna, I guess more recently, can, can don, and she can butch it up and climb up the social scale. Men cannot do that. Okay, so when when um, white males say would do blackface and and exaggerated facial features, is that similar? Yes. Okay, it's, that's it's, and that was. In other words, it's it's less about biology than about class, which is what I'm talking about here. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify because that was the first thing I thought of, and of course, somebody did mention when I asked that question. Somebody mentioned that they had attended those sort of things as a child right. and nobody thought there was anything wrong with it and i oh, think that's exactly what you're talking about right all this we saw this with governor northam in virginia uh him in blackface and then him in a, in a ku klux klan uh, uh uniform I'm, the question that i asked then is in what kind of culture can a medical doctor in education post these kinds of images on his Facebook, on, on his, uh, in his yearbook? Well, I, I'm old enough that um, so-called minstrel shows were fairly well accepted entertainment. Nobody thought twice about and um, doing, I mean, you know, even as a kid, I think they made me uncomfortable, but there were lots and lots of whether people. The, whether the show was Will and Grace or whether it's whatever the thing might be, we, we had, we, the names change and the situations change, but the, the comedy of, the comedy of, 
of upper manners and lower manners and the comedy of who has power and who doesn't and how we keep it. They're always finding new ways of demonstrating this. Definitely. It's a lot to think about. Yes. Um, Thank you. So somebody here asked if you can talk about the impact all of this has had on people of color and the present state of America. Good luck with that, Ed. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, I want to thank anyone who, who anyone who, uh, white, black, or in between. I did this, if I think I'm making a point here, is that I think we need to rethink the polarity, the binary between black and white, and really to underestimate the uh, the first peoples in this particular country uh, who were horrifically enslaved and killed in, in all kinds of ways, all, all the way from Massachusetts, all the way down. So that the conversation about enslavement in this particular country is not just two groups of people. Edward, we're going to have to wrap things up because we have another program um, coming up. But here's what I'll do. Um, so to everyone watching, I'll send out the link that has the YouTube recording. And I'll also send out the links that I'll have if you were interested in uh, joining Edward on his tour. I've been myself. It was awesome. Um, and so I'll send those out. I probably won't be able to send those out though until Monday or um, Tuesday just because we have other things going on. But um, Edward, thank you so much as always for joining us. Greatly appreciate you sharing your knowledge and insight with us. Patty, thanks for, as always, helping out with the chat, the Q&A, et cetera, et cetera. And thank you, and... Robert, for the large check that you will send me for the production. <laughs> oh, yeah, big check. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, this has been really um, fascinating. I enjoy all of your programs, Ed, but there's so much depth that, uh, yeah, you can tell from the questions people are asking, and many people have been engaged in this one. Well, you know what, These, we were, I'm taking nine week courses and classes and we're doing it in 40 minutes of whatever. I, I, I humbly grateful that folks would, would do some learning with, with me here. And so thank you. Oh yeah, no, thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum, be at peace everybody. Bye. Yeah.